Chapter 18, we're going to look at all verses, uh, all the verses uh, through verse 24. The topic, God calls to saints in tribulation Babylon, come out of her, my people. The title of our message, come out, come out in Babylon you are. Let's pray. Father, what a joy to be here this morning uh, in fellowship with other saints. A little taste of heaven, Lord, to our spirit. Appreciate the singing, and now we have your word open before us. Minister to us through it. In Jesus' name we pray, and those who agreed said, amen. Disaster movies always feature a chaotic evacuation sequence, whether it's a sudden zombie apocalypse or an impending asteroid strike, the roads gridlock leading to fistfights and shootings. It only takes 30, 40 seconds for human beings to revert to the animalistic behavior. God will call for an evacuation of the great tribulation city of Babylon. Look down at verse 4. Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. Believers living in that wicked city will be forewarned of the pouring out of the wrath of God against it, and they will flee. We are living in the church age that precedes the great tribulation. Jesus has firmly promised us that he will keep us out of the entirety of the great tribulation. He will accomplish it by coming in the clouds, resurrecting the dead in Christ, and instantaneously transforming living believers. We call this entire sequence the rapture of the church. It is an evacuation that will cause a global chaos for non-believers left behind. We patiently wait for the coming of the Lord to take us to the place he has been preparing for us. While waiting, we are under a kind of spiritual general evacuation order. The apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, uh, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 6, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? What part has a believer with an unbeliever? Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Before you act on that advice, though, Paul also said, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people, yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. We are to come out from among non-believers while simultaneously living among them. We are talking about the biblical doctrine of separation. I'll organize my comments around two points. Number one, separation from the world is something you laud. And number two, separation from the world is not something you lament. Let's take a look at our approval of separation in verses one through eight. You can apply the doctrine of separation in nine words of this famous Christian cliche, be in the world, but not of the world. A theological definition might go like this. Biblical separation is the recognition that God has called believers out of the world and into a personal and corporate purity amid sinful cultures. The Apostle Paul put it like this to the church he founded in Thessalonica. You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Three things ought to immediately amaze us. First, you are saved and set apart to serve God. We are, Peter says in one of his epistles, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people but are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. Second, you are on the path of purity, enabled to resist sin and Satan. You can be holy as God is holy. And third, you have the assurance that we are safe from the coming wrath of God that is the great tribulation. My response in Greek would be, wowza. I mean, that's, that's exciting. I mean, think about what, uh, what it means to be a Christian. Set apart to find purpose and have joy in your life and kept from this hour that is coming upon the world. The separated life is not a burden. It's a blessing. It is liberating. 
We always think of separation, or not, I shouldn't say always, but a lot of people think of separation as a list of mostly don'ts. I can't do a bunch of things now because I'm a Christian. And, and it brings kind of a sour attitude, but there's nothing more liberating than being a Christian. The Apostle Peter went on to point out, Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Uh, the truth is, the Christian life is a life that is intended to be a life of victory over things that uh, are really no good for you. Uh, the simplest way I can put it is that if you're a father, well, of course, you know, if you're a parent, but, you know, do you want what's best for your children? Or are, in terms of the way that you restrict them uh, or look at them and decide what they're capable of? Take uh, media, for example. I mean, are you, your 10-year-old, are, are you restricting them from watching mature television because you, you want to have them be in a bad mood all the time? Are they kicking the dirt? Or do you know that it's just no good for them? And, and so whatever God seems to restrict or, or whatever he puts down for your life, it's, it's that of a, of a good father who knows how to give the best gifts. It's good for you. And so this idea that, that you know, being a Christian is some kind of a burden is just not true. In the short time we have on earth, we can overcome things that would otherwise enslave us and instead live a spirit-led life of purpose, discovering the good works God has before prepared for us. Ours is not a purpose-driven life. It is rather a spirit-led life that ends up having purpose. In verse one, after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. Thus far in the revelation, Jesus took a scroll from his father and opened its seven seals. When Jesus opened the seventh seal, seven angels having trumpets to blow were revealed. When the seventh trumpet was blown, seven angels having seven bowls full of the wrath of God to pour out upon earth came forward. When the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. The next event will be the glorious second coming of Jesus to earth with his saints. The seals, trumpets, and bowls take you chronologically through the seven-year great tribulation. They are the sequential points on a revelation timeline. The apostle John often pauses during the sequence of seals, trumpets, and bowls, providing details about certain intervening events. Chapter 17 and 18 are a pause. In them, we discover two Babylons operating during the Great Tribulation. Chapter 17 revealed Babylon in its mystery form as a global religious system. Chapter 18 describes Babylon in its municipal form as a global political and commercial system embodied in a city, the literal city of Babylon on the river Euphrates. If you're interested in angels and who isn't, the revelation is a gold mine of information. Start there. Angels are prominent, mentioned over 70 times. Don Stewart writes, from preaching the everlasting gospel to the binding of Satan into the abyss, angels are in the midst of the program of God at the end times. And so uh, it just struck me that this is the place where you see angels at work uh, more than any place. Having great authority reminds us that God delegates tasks and gives us the authority to carry them out. To have the treasure of the gospel in our frail fleshly vessels is not a plan we would sign off on. Uh, we're just not great at it. Uh, we are when we allow the Holy Spirit to lead and when we yield to him. But, um, you know, this is, uh, to us it would seem dangerous, you know, to, to, to entrust such a message with such import to folks like us. Uh, but the Lord does that. And, and we have authority. It should humble us. Think of it. You can confidently tell a person that believing in Jesus is salvation and that they will have the forgiveness of their sins and eternal life. Wow, that's pretty amazing, you understand? You're not saying, hey, if you come to this church, you know, we can all work together and hopefully we can get saved one day. I mean, you're declaring as a child of God that what happened to you can happen to them and that your sins can be forgiven as far from the east as from the west and that you can know you have salvation right now. That's the kind of authority the Lord delegates. This angel illuminates earth with his glory. 
Much is veiled to our perception. We walk by faith and not by sight. In the future, we will behold things as they are with unveiled senses. Verse two, and he cried mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Yes, this is future Babylon in Iraq. Thriving is a world capital city. It isn't a code name for Rome or New York or Dubai or Riverdale. It's none of those places. Author Joel Rosenberg recently wrote, ancient biblical prophecies in both the Old and the New Testaments indicate Iraq will become the wealthiest and most powerful country in the world in the end of days and the most evil. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah said that in the day of the Lord, the city of Babylon would be destroyed to never again be inhabited. Jeremiah expressed the same scenario for tribulation Babylon. Here's the opinion of a scholar who takes the allegorical approach to the Revelation. I do not believe that the city of Babylon in the book of the Revelation should be seen as representing some single city or nation, but rather for New Testament people, it symbolizes the hideous wickedness seen everywhere in the world. Preterists are those who teach that the Revelation was mostly fulfilled in the events of the first century with the fall of Jerusalem. They say, and I quote, Babylon represents first century Jerusalem. It's not a symbol for Rome, New York City, or any city anywhere. Amillennialists believe that Jesus is currently sitting on the throne of David and that the present church age is the kingdom over which Christ reigns. Donald Guthrie suggests that, and I quote, the symbol of Babylon stood for the oppressors of God's people. If you abandon the literal futurist interpretation Babylon can mean anything that you propose. If it can mean anything, then it means nothing. Seriously, you, uh, you could hear a dozen or 200 studies on Babylon from those who are in an allegorical or preterist or some other uh, amillennialist camp and hear 200 different impressions of what Babylon really is. Uh, and, and you know what? That can't be true. That... that a Christian would be the first one to say, you can't just make the Bible mean whatever you want it to mean, right? Don't you tell people, people say stuff to you and they, they say, oh no, that's out of context. You're making the Bible mean what it doesn't mean. But then these guys turn around and say, well, Babylon, you know, it can't be the literal city because none of these prophecies are literal. And so it's just evil in general, or it's this thing or that thing. Uh, if it can mean anything, it means nothing. The so-called golden rule of biblical interpretation is, if the plain sense of scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Nothing is more clear than that Babylon is a real city. Isaiah thought it would be, Jeremiah thought it would be, and John is writing about Babylon on the river Euphrates. The futurist position we hold is the only one that obeys the golden rule, the only one that considers Babylon throughout biblical history. The Tower of Babel, was mankind's first attempt to build in defiance of God. Tribulation Babylon in that same site will be mankind's final attempt to build in defiance of God. The angel announces what the rest of the chapter describes, the burning of tribulation Babylon by God just before Jesus Christ returns to earth. The repetition of is fallen may reflect that religious Babylon falls first mid-trib and then the city falls as the tribulation nears its end. Afterward, Babylon is a prison to incarcerate demons during the 1,000 year reign of the Lord. God has an extensive prison system for evil supernatural creatures. Earlier in the Revelation, we read about a place called the Abyss. God also incarcerates wicked supernaturals near the Euphrates River. We saw that in chapter nine. And in the New Testament, both Peter and Jude say that a place called Tartarus or Tartarus, is a supernatural prison. After its destruction, Babylon will become a prison and it will be overrun by scavenger birds. There's something disturbing about vultures picking away at human carcasses. It just, ew. And they're big. You know, vultures are big, scary. They're bigger than, anything bigger than a blue jay is too big for me. <laughs> Pigeons, crows, I mean, when you, but you, you get into some of these vultures, 
They'll put your eye out. Verse three, for all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Think Pleasure Island in Pinocchio. The boys can drink and cuss and smoke and fight and vandalize all they want. Afterwards, they are enslaved as beasts of burden. Verse four, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues for her sins have reached to heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. Believers will live and work in Babylon. Undoubtedly, some will be like Daniel and others will be like Lot was in Sodom. Share her sins doesn't mean they participate in sins. God calls them out so they won't share in his punishment for Babylon's sins. Verse six, render to her just as she rendered to you and repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and am no widow and will not see sorrow. Therefore her plagues will come on her in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. And we can get so discouraged in the world that non-believers always seem to prosper and we don't. Uh, of course, it's not true. Uh, non-believers have their share of trouble. But in this life, especially in the next, sin pays its awful wages, death and eternal conscious torment. Uh, the wicked have um, temporary, you know, I guess if the wicked can drive Ferraris, you know, drive a Ferrari, go to heaven, you know, because you're going to end up in hell. Uh, so let them have it. Uh, let them have their joys now, their fleshly joys, I guess, and share the gospel with them. Don't be upset that non-believers seem to have more than you because you're rich in heaven beyond measure. Uh, and, and we need to be reminded of that. Non-believers in every dispensation scoff at the prediction of God's judgment. They misunderstand that his long suffering waits for them to repent. In the end, non-believers will get what they deserve by having rejected belief in Jesus Christ. Jesus prayed for us saying to God the Father, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. We are in the world on assignment from God. Hanford is my posting as a pastor. I'm here unless I receive orders somewhere else. And so are you. You wanna get out of Hanford? You wanna get out of California? God needs to fill in the blank. You need to be able to say, Jesus is calling me out of here to fill in the blank. He sends you. You don't just bring him along with you. Uh, that's not to say that you can't leave Hanford or make any moves or anything like that. It's just to say what we already know in our hearts, that our lives belong to the Lord, that we should be living sacrifices uh, for him. One of the brothers here says it homespun in this question, was you sent or did you just went? Answer that question when you want to move. Separation from the world is not something you lament. The Notre Dame Cathedral fire broke out on April 15, 2019. By the time it was extinguished, the building spire had collapsed and most of its roof had been destroyed and its upper walls were severely damaged. Many works of art and religious relics suffered smoke damage and some of the exterior art was damaged or destroyed. The French president went to Notre Dame and gave a brief address there. Numerous world religions and government leaders extended condolences. Through the night of the fire and into the next day, people gathered along the River Seine to hold vigils, sing and pray. I recall seeing people weeping as if a loved one had died. Verse nine, the kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, alas, alas, that great city, Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. Fornication is an all-inclusive term for sexual sin. Fornication also describes how God views idolatry. It is a spiritual unfaithfulness, infidelity, fornication against him. Verse 11, and the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. 
merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat and cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, Pastor Jean's beans, and the bodies and the souls of men. I just wanted to see if you were following along. I am surprised coffee isn't mentioned there, but anyway. We don't need to look at all the Minecraft materials listed here. We do need to highlight, however briefly, the bodies and souls of men. This is slavery and human trafficking on a scale hitherto undreamt of. And so that is the featured uh, commerce of the city of Babylon. The reign of the beast, the Antichrist, and the rebuilding of Babylon are the apexes of what Satan can achieve. His attempt to be like God is a miserable failure. Verse 14, the fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you, and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more at all. The merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour such great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who travel by ship, sailors and as many as trade on the sea, stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what is like this great city? They threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she is made desolate. I've probably attended more funerals and graveside services than anyone here. It's an occupational hazard. If you are a funeral crasher, there's something wrong with you. But uh, it, there, uh, I won't go into that. These verses read like a eulogy for a non-believer. All sorrow, no hope, unless it's a false hope. The things mentioned are all material, nothing spiritual. Those of you who've attended a memorial or a funeral and you're, you're, just, you're not sure if the deceased is a, is a believer, and so people can't get up and rejoice at their homecoming to heaven, and then their friends and family who are not saved get up and say the most ridiculous things, trying to eulogize them, things that have no even material value in terms of what they stood for and who they were and things like that. This is a eulogy for Babylon. They keep calling it a great city when from God's perspective, it's the most wicked city that ever existed. And so that's the deal. Skip verse 20 for a moment, verse 21. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it in the sea. The only thing I missed from Late Night with David Letterman is the segment, Will It Float? Do you remember that? I, I always got him wrong. I found out yesterday that slices of watermelon will float. Did you know that? You probably knew that because you're smart. Why would I be floating watermelon? Koi like watermelon. Then they go crazy for it. All right, that's what I did yesterday. Just trying to be transparent. Uh, this is my koi shirt, by the way. Anyway, great millstones don't float. The angel will throw one into the sea and it will disappear to visually dramatize the total and complete final disappearance of Babylon. Verse 21, then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, thus with violence, the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. Sound of harpists, musicians, flautists, trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you anymore. And the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. The voice of the bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth. For by your sorcery, all the nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth. A person's reaction to something says a lot about them. Lamenting Babylon's destruction says that the world's final rulers will be wicked, immoral, malevolent men. Do you have reactions to things going on in the world that are not quite Christ-like? Probably do. Think about it. Talk to the Lord about it. Tribulation saints in Babylon will flee. 
but some assigned to Babylon will already have been martyred. Your assignment on earth may not be without danger or hardship. Uh, and so the, the idea that, uh, you know, this is the place for me, but it's uncomfortable or I don't like it, or it might even be slightly dangerous, really have to take that up with the Lord because some of the postings that we see in the Bible, they were kind of dangerous. Daniel in Babylon, in Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, had some problems along the way. Uh, lion's den among them, you know, thrown, thrown in with the lions because he prayed. Uh, and, and so, you know, the Lord brought him through it, but uh, you can't base your decisions on comfort and ease. Uh, if you do that, uh, you're going to just be useless serving the Lord. Back to verse 20. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. I found it difficult to cry when Notre Dame was burning. When things like that happen, I tend to remember the words of the apostle Peter from 2 Peter 3. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and both earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, Look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Peter essentially gives us a burn notice. Not just Notre Dame, it's all going to burn. Now, it shouldn't be, we shouldn't be gleeful about it. We shouldn't just go around saying, ah, it's all going to burn. Uh, but we do need to get that truth across, that there is something greater than this life in this world, and it's the life in the world to come. And it's a relationship with Jesus Christ. Back in the 6th century BC, when Babylon was big, Daniel and his three friends, teenagers, were assigned there by God. They didn't just survive, they thrived spiritually. In between the Babylons of Daniel and the Great Tribulation, we can survive and thrive in the world. We do it by maintaining a healthy spiritual separation, by being in the world, but not of it, by turning to God, from idols. An easy example that Paul the Apostle uses, don't marry a non-believer. Uh, your marriage might have enough trouble already without you having uh, unequally yoked with a non-believer. Another easy example is not to partner in business with non-believers. These are things Paul says directly. Don't be unequally yoked with non-believers. Beyond those, you're going to have to talk to the Lord because there's no real cookie cutter method of going through this. Whatever list I would give you, that's my list. Those are the things the Lord and I have worked out over the years. And yeah, there's things I don't do uh, because the Lord knows they're not good for me. And there's things I feel like I have the freedom to do because they don't stumble me. And so that's up to you and the Lord. Uh, it's a cop out to, to think, you know, beyond what is you know, stated in scripture that Christians do this or they don't do that. Figure it out. Uh, just know that you're always in a fight with the flesh and your flesh can disguise itself in a way that makes you do things that uh, maybe you should, maybe you shouldn't. Okay, so be careful. With Jesus leading, you're going to have to discover along life's journey things that are your do's and don'ts. And again, Jesus isn't trying to burden you or keep you from enjoying life. Quite the contrary. Instead of being unequally yoked with non-believers, his yoke is what? Easy. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light.